It's always one of the favorite things to favorite things to do, one of the favorite times for me as a pastor to dedicate children to the Lord. Uh, those of you that are around here quite often understand that one of the great passions of my heart is parenting, is especially fathers discipling their children in the Lord. And uh, we're going to look at that a little bit today in more detail. But uh, I'm just so thankful for these two babies and uh, the other one that's going to be dedicated someday and others that are coming. We're just grateful for the way that God is, is moving. This past uh, season in our life as a church, we have been focused on uh, a couple of things. One of them, we, we went through a series talking about being free in Jesus. How many of you remember that? Good. That was a good series. And we went from that to talking about the forgotten God, the Holy Spirit, and how the church has tended to set aside the Holy Spirit as the third part of the Trinity of God. And so we focused on that. And that led us into a series where we began to talk about boldness out of Acts uh, 4.29. And uh, as we were ministering this week, several people came, and I would guess uh, a little bit over 30 of us, I didn't count specifically, but a few over 30 of us uh, came together and began to go out in the name of Jesus and just be a, a light and begin to pray over people. And uh, it was an amazing experience, and I think we're going to have a few of those stories shared this morning. So if you were here with us, you should just be ready in case I call on you. But as we were doing this, uh, the Lord led me to 1 Corinthians 13, which is in your notes there. And um, the Lord led me to this message for today uh, entitled, Loving Boldly. And, uh, you know, being bold is one thing. Loving boldly is another thing. Being bold, a lot of people can be bold. As a matter of fact, some people are just naturally bold, right? Right? Do you know anybody who's naturally bold? They'll just do anything. Some kids are bolder than other kids. You watch them and they'll try anything. And then there are kids who are timid. And, and there are adults who are bold and there are adults who are timid. And this morning, I want to look at this theme of loving boldly. And I just want to read a couple of verses at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 13. Because I think it speaks to some of what we have been experiencing and what I think the Lord wants to do for us as we continue to be people who are focused out there on people outside of ourselves. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 says, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor and I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing." Love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous, love does not brag and is not arrogant, love does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account wrong suffered, it does not rejoice in unrighteousness but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. That passage is not an unfamiliar part of the Bible to many people, even people who don't go to church hear that at weddings. And it's a passage that is very commonly read and very commonly referred to. But if you think about it, if you look at it, I want you to see, especially at the end of verse 3, it says, If I surrender my body even to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. In other words, I can do the most extreme things, and if I don't have love, it doesn't profit. And this morning I want to talk about being a people who are willing to love boldly. You know, we dedicated these children to the Lord this morning. Parenting is a bold process. How many of you know that there are times in your parenting where you have to be, take bold steps of faith, bold steps of, of parenting? Amen? Sometimes when you just have to say what needs to be said and sometimes you have to take a step of letting go what needs to be let go of. Amen. And there is a boldness in that. There's a releasing. And so today I want to talk about what it means to live boldly, to love boldly in a couple of areas. This past week, as I said, uh, every evening we gathered at seven o'clock. And there were between um, 15 and 20 almost every evening, and we, we prayed. We just said, Lord, we want you to take us to the places in the city where people need to hear about you. And so we went to the, we, we began to go out. Then we would just talk about, well, where do you feel led to go? And we would go to a place and look for people that might need to be prayed for and ask the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us and and uh, there were people in this group, I want you to know this morning, some of you still won't believe this, but there were people in this group who are absolutely not extroverts or introverts. Somebody say amen. 
There were introverts who for the first time began to just look at people and begin to smile at people and begin to just make an effort to make eye contact. Can anybody identify with that level of introversion? Introversion. I think that's a word, actually. It is a word. Thank you. It's, an, it's a word. Introversion. And so these people came because they wanted to get into another level and they wanted to step into a new place of boldness in God. And, and, uh, and they did. They did. I, I remember, uh, I think it was the second night Katrina was with us. Katrina is an introvert, somewhat. And I remember the second evening that she was with us, how she came back. I believe she danced from the car in the parking lot because she was so excited that she had gotten past the, the fear and begun to just speak to people. And it was amazing to see and to hear how God was working through her as she took that step of faith and stepped out and began to speak to people about Jesus and to say, can I pray with you? Is that true? Did you dance? I heard there was dancing in the parking lot. But it doesn't, but here's the thing. We went out and we prayed for a lot of people. My guess is that there were 120 or more people to this week that got a touch from God because these people were faithful and went out to different places and prayed over families and individuals and so forth. But, but here's what the Lord spoke to me near the end of the week. If we do all of this, if we're bold for God, if we're just crazy bold for God and we don't love the people, it won't make a difference. You see, whatever we do in life, whether it's parenting or whether it's the Christian life, whatever we do, it comes down to, do we have love for other people? Do we have love? And so if I would, I would add to this passage in 1 Corinthians 13, if I am the boldest for Jesus and I'm willing to go anywhere and do anything, but I do not have love, it profits me nothing to be that person. So I challenge us today to consider, can we live our lives boldly? Can we love your children boldly and love God's children boldly? I neglected to mention that we have kids packs on the table for 3 to 7 year old, 3 to 12 year olds. If you want to grab one of those and follow along because we have those children in the service with us and you're welcome. There's some crayons there and you can follow along. Or if you're older than 12 and you're just bored with my message, you can go get one of those packs and color it or something. Let's talk today. Oh... <laughs> You're already bored with the message? That's sad. So, so I want to talk about loving boldly in two areas today. And, and uh, the first one is loving our children boldly. How many of you in the room have children? Okay, that's, a, that's a good portion of you. So how many of you have children that still live at home? So I'm getting a good period. How many of you have children that are grown and all out of the house? So there. Loving children, I'm told, because our children still all live at home, I'm told that, it, you know, parenting never stops. You, you continue to parent. You, you, have, you just shifts in the way that you're parenting. So let's look at this today. And I want to suggest to you, these are just a list that I felt like the Lord gave me of, of ways that we should love our children boldly. Now, how many of you have no children? So that's a group as well. I don't want to leave you out. I want you to know that, that you can still take things from this and apply it to your life. And so we're going to talk about loving children in our families, and then we're going to talk about loving uh, God's children. So let's look at these three do's that I have, three do's in regard to loving your children. First of all, the most important thing that you can do if you want to love your children boldly is to love God and love your spouse. Love God and love your spouse. In Luke 10, 27, the Bible tells us you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Everything we do begins by loving God. And the way we love God depends on how much we have learned to be loved by God. Some of the reasons we're not very good at loving God is because we haven't learned yet to receive His love. But that's for another time. But you begin by loving God and you must love your spouse and love your spouse unconditionally. I, I know a lot of families, perhaps mine included at sometimes, a lot of marriages who have shifted from putting the marriage first to putting the children first. Has that ever happened in your life where you find yourself, you've put the children ahead of your marriage, and so you're trying to work so hard at loving the children and you miss the opportunity to love your spouse. I believe that happens in, in too many homes, and that's why after the children are gone, the husband and wife look at each other and say, who are you? We, 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 don't have, we don't really have anything in common. We haven't developed our relationship. We haven't loved each other. And therefore, what we've done is we put all of our life into our children. Now we've got nothing. That happens too often. 
Don't be that couple. Love your spouse first and then love your children. Love your spouse in a way that is meaningful. Then you will be empowered to love your children boldly. That's the first do. These are really simple and short. I hope they're not going to take that long. Love God and love your spouse. Number two, love God. Oh, sorry, love and live your life authentically. Love and live your life authentically. There's a movie from years ago. I forget the title of the movie, but I just remember this line from it. Love means never having to say you're sorry. How many of you have heard that line before? That is hogwash baloney. <laughs> that is hogwash baloney. Love does not mean never having to say you're sorry. Love means when you've messed up, you say you're sorry. Because you're going to mess up, brother. <laughs> you're going to mess up. And loving authentically means you are humble enough to admit you were wrong and to say, I'm sorry. As guys, as especially... I. I picked this up on, uh, somewhere uh, on Dr. Dobson or something, but um, I picked this up. That we need to learn how to say this on a regular basis. Here, are you, uh, why don't you guys especially rehearse this with me? You're right. Uh, I just hear laughter. I don't hear, I don't, nobody's willing to say it. All right, guys, I want you to say this. You're right. I am wrong. And I'm sorry. That's something you just need to rehearse and just say many, many, many times in your life. Because many times she is right and you're wrong. But here's, a, you know what? Now I'm going to just hit the ladies for just a minute. Every now and then, I know it doesn't happen often. But every now and then you're wrong. And you could do the same thing. You're right. So ladies, you, you, why don't you rehearse with me? You're right. I'm wrong, and I'm sorry. See, now, some of you, that, that was the first time you heard that from your spouse in, like, years. <laughs> but loving authentically is a matter of humility to where you are willing to recognize, I didn't, I didn't get that right. I didn't hit that right. And it's not just with your spouse. Loving and living authentically means that when you mess up with your kids, and you will mess up, Ryan and Danielle. I know you haven't yet, because you haven't had enough time. You've been perfect parents. Daniel and Naomi, you've probably messed up once or twice. You've had a, a few more? Okay, a few times. But, but every parent is going to mess up in the same way that every spouse is going to mess up. And loving authentically means you are ready and willing to look at your children and say, you were right, I was wrong, and I'm sorry. Or, Dad just screwed up completely, and I'm really sorry that I did that. That's what loving authentically means. Loving authentically is a matter of humility. Do I really care? Loving authentically means asking yourself the hard questions day in and day out like this. Do I really care about anybody else besides myself? When was the last time you asked that and you thought about your lifestyle, you thought about your decisions? Do I really care about anybody else, especially these in my home? Am I focused on my rights or on my responsibilities? And have I spent this day on behalf of myself or of others? Guys, this is tough. Uh, it, it is for me and, and, and actually anybody who works outside of the home. So guys and gals, you work outside of the home and you get home in the evening. And the, most of us, the last thing we want to do is take care of our family. Well, okay, I'm the only one in the room that feels that everybody else is like, this is going to be great. I get to serve everybody else when I get home, right? You just look, look forward to the moment when you can just lay down your life for everybody else. Probably not naturally. Maybe you do from time to time. But loving others authentically means I recognize my life is not about myself. Authentic love is selfless, is humble, and is willing to allow others to speak into our lives about what they see. Let me just give you a couple things. If your children cannot tell you how they feel about your parenting, you're not loving authentically. I'll say it again. If your children, whether they're young or old, can't tell you how they feel about your relationship with them, you are not loving authentically. Because you're the big person in the room. And as the big person for your children, you have got to be able to hear every criticism they ever give to you, ever level at you. 
I'm not saying we always do, but you need to be. We need to be that kind of people, willing. And you know what? Not only willing, but as parents who love authentically, we need to be actively pursuing. What's it like to be a son in my house? What's it like for you? What do you experience? It wasn't that long ago that Ellie and I had a little experience in our car. and No, it wasn't in the car. It was, we were playing a game. And uh, something happened, and, and we got upset, and I said some things to her. Uh, no, it was another time. Boy, we've had so many times when, when it's apparently I've lost track. But there was a time when Ellie looked at me, and she said, it just felt like you were speaking harshly to me. Do you know what I felt at that moment? Suck it up, buttercup. Oh, yeah. Look, you guys are so critical of me today. As if this has never happened in your life. I'm like, harsh. That's not harsh. You want harsh, I'll give you. Anybody ever? Huh? You don't know what harsh is. That's what I felt. But as an authentic lover, I have to be able to step back and say, I'm very sorry, sweetheart, that it felt harsh to you. That certainly wasn't my intention. I don't intend to treat you harshly. And I will work at how I tone my voice. Dad, let me, let me tell you something. Your voice is powerful. Your voice and your tone of voice is powerful. And, and you can say something that you're just trying to be clear about. You know, let me be clear. And what you're actually doing is, is, is digging into the soul of your child with a harshness that they're being impacted by for life. I'm sure that's true of women as well, but I know that a man's voice has a command with it, that it has a level of tone with it that can come across in a way that we don't want it to come across. Well, maybe we did at the moment, right? Maybe we did at the moment want it to come across. Are, you, are y'all following me? I'm, talking about, I'm just trying to be really practical today about how do you love boldly. Loving boldly means that you love authentically, which means you are open to the feedback that you need to have in your life. Okay. I've hit that one hard enough. Authenticity is a risk because when you love authentically, when you love boldly, you open yourself up to the other. Everybody say the other. Everybody say the other. The other is everybody else. Everybody other than me. The other. You open yourself to that other person's insight, that other person's perspective, that other person's view of what's going on. And that is always a risk because you don't have any control over the other. Right? So I would suggest if we're going to love our children boldly, we have to love, our, love God and love our spouse, love and live authentically. And then I want to suggest that thirdly, you live in, live an everyday love. Live an everyday love. Now, I don't know who I'm speaking to here today, but I do know there is a type of person who is so strategic and so planned and so specific about what's going to happen at what moment in time that they miss too many moments of love. Maybe you can identify as that person. I don't know. But I know that there, are, there is a type of person who, who likes to make sure everything happens the way they planned it. Does that sound like anybody that you know? They like to make sure this is going to happen. And this, I remember years ago, uh, years ago, Linda and I were going to visit her family in Michigan. And uh, we, were, we were planning to go. And she began to ask me, now what are we going to talk about when we get there? And I thought, What? We're going to talk about whatever comes up. And she said, no, no. Now, when we get there, we need, you know, we, we need to, what are, the, what are the topics that we need to talk about? It was a whole different way of looking at life. What? You actually plan your interactions with people? I just kind of hang out and let what happens, happens. You know, both of those are strengths. Both of those are actually strengths and weaknesses. Because if you just hang out and let what happens, happens, you probably never get down to what really needs to happen. Never. And if you always have to plan everything, you probably never catch the moments that happen moment by moment. So that it's the time when you're in the vehicle with your child that you have a moment, you have an opportunity, you have an open door, you have a conversation that can happen that you didn't plan, you didn't strategize, you didn't make it happen. You're just aware, you're looking for opportunities to love in the moment. Living and loving everyday love means you're looking moment by moment for opportunities to love your children, to love your spouse, to love others. 
Loving and an everyday love, and this is a really, really hard one for me, I'll be very honest, is when you look in an everyday opportunity to compliment your children or the people around you. How many of you are just natural complimenters? There's like five in the room. Uh, that's probably true. How many of you are unnatural complimenters? <laughs> you have to think about, what could I possibly compliment you on? Let's see. Let me think about it for a while. Let me give you a clue. If you're sitting with your child and you want to compliment, then don't go, don't go, let me see. I have to think about it. What could I possibly compliment you on? That's probably not the way to do it. But you should be planning in, for those moments and thinking about that. What have I seen them do right? How many of you know that most of our time we tell our kids what they do wrong? Stop, no, no, stop, no, 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 stop. And we need to say, yes, good, that's great, good job. Yes, we see you doing that. Are you with me? And so an everyday love is looking for the moments that come about that we didn't plan, that we didn't strategize. God just put them there in front of us. And you have your kids in your home every day, moment by moment, you have opportunities to love them in ways that you hadn't actually planned for, but God gives you that opportunity. So you need to take time to listen, take time to connect. Take time. Everybody say time. Dad, say time. Dad, say time. you got to take time. And the more kids you have, the more time. But you got to take time. you got to make time. So when my kids said to me on multiple occasions, we need to go fishing after about the, I, I don't, sometimes it takes me a few. After about the third time, I was like, we need to go fishing. Because they're asking to go fishing. And so we went fishing because they wanted time with dad. I'm going to just give you a final word of wisdom here on this area of loving our children boldly. And that is, as far as I know, at the end of life, oh, it's actually for my next point, but I'm going to tell you now. At the end of life, no one has looked back and said, man, I wish I'd have had more swimming lessons. Man, if I'd have just had a little more t-ball. You know what people long for at the end of life? More time with the people they loved. So dad, mom, you want to love boldly. You need, to, you need to build your life in a way that you give your children time with you. By the way, I don't have my phone up here with me. I got my iPad. This is not time with me. Right? This is time sitting with me and my electronic friends. Time with your family is a part of loving boldly. So, three do's. Love God and love your spouse. Love authentically and live an everyday love. Three don'ts. Oh, I thought I was moving on to the next. Okay, we're, we're running out of time here. Three don'ts. Three don'ts. Here they are. Number one, don't do it all. Don't do it all. That's where I, this is actually where in my notes, the, the comment I just made was supposed to be made. There's nobody at the end of their days or at the end that is saying, man, if I'd have just had, if I'd have just had three more activities, what they wish they had more of was time with dad, time with mom. And if you try to do it all, I'm especially talking to your parents that have little kids and you're just starting on this journey. You try to do it all, you will miss the opportunities to be with your kids. You'll miss those opportunities. That doesn't mean you can't do some. That doesn't mean you can't do activities and be involved in things. But too many American Christian families think they have to do it all. And you don't. That's a lie. You don't have to do it all. You don't even have to do any of it. What your child wants is you. What your child wants is relationship with you. What your child wants is time with you. They want to hear your voice. They want to see your eyes. They want you hearing their dreams. They want you to enter their world. They want to tag along with you when you do something important. They want to be a part of what you're doing in your everyday life because you are the significant thing that God has given to your children. So when you try to have them do it all, you miss what I would say. Remember when Mary and Martha were, were, uh, were waiting? Jesus was at the house and uh, I always get it wrong. Martha, Martha, Mary chose the better part. Is that right? Martha, Martha, Mary, what was the better part? Sitting at Jesus' feet. I believe that in parenting we can take that same principle and say whoever, whoever, don't miss the better part. The better part is just time with your kids. 
you spend some time with them, it'll make the bigger difference than you giving them activities and trying to do it all. You should not be trying to do it all. That, that is just, uh, that's my, I can't say it strongly enough to American parents, especially of young children, and especially as they get older. And you think, oh, they could try this and they could do this and they want to go and they could, and you know what? They're going to miss time with you because you're sending them off to be with somebody else all the time. Number two, don't, this is a don't, don't give them everything. Don't give them everything. Now, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking a lot of you are going to be like, well, I can't give them everything. I'm not that wealthy. But here's the thing. Even people who aren't that wealthy are giving them everything you can give them. So even within what you can give, there are times as a parent that you need to step back and say, I'm not going to give that. I'm going to allow them an opportunity to earn that. Do you know that one of the, one of the great flaws in Christian parenting and in, in our cultural parenting today is that children don't have any concept of how much money is worth because they've just been given whatever they want. They've just been given whatever is out there. What's the latest thing they've been given? And I'm not saying that you did that, but if you're not careful and you don't teach what I'm going to give you something here, and, and I know I sound really old-fashioned today, but I'm going to go to the Bible so it's not me. All right? So 2 Thessalonians, it's, a, it's a, uh, a, couple of, a couple of verses that speak to this issue of what I call just a work ethic. And we don't really preach on it that much, but 2, Corinthians, or 2 Thessalonians, if you have your Bibles, turn to chapter 3, verse 6. Now listen, this is Paul's uh, letter to the church and he's explaining to them how people ought to live. And he says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads, to an, leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with labor and hardship, we kept working night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you. Verse 9, not because we do not have the right to this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you so that you would follow our example. Verse 10 is the key. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. Did you know that that was a verse in the Bible? If someone is not willing to work, he should not eat. So instead of me just claiming I'm an old-fashioned person, I'm going to go to the Bible and say, that's a principle we got to teach our kids. Don't give your children everything. Teach them how to work and teach them the value of money. So I'm just going to give you a little secret, and now you're going to know why our kids are whatever they are. We have never given our kids an allowance. Now you understand. We try to give them opportunities, and they've had places where they can go and work and earn money, but we've never just given them money just because, what? I'm sorry, I don't understand that. I do understand giving children money when they get older and letting them manage it, teaching them how to manage money. I understand that, and so I'm not, I'm not just saying don't ever do that, but I'm saying, parents, don't give your kids everything. Teach them how to work. Teach them responsibility. Teach them that if you don't do this, this doesn't happen. Right? These are like really, they seem like really simple things, but I think they're missing in a lot of places today. So don't give them everything. All right, number three, before I get too old-fashioned. Don't miss an opportunity. Well, that one is kind of tough because I probably should say when you miss an opportunity, recognize it because you're going to miss opportunities. But here's, here's what I want to say, and this is going to tie us into our next point. I believe that one of the great responsibilities of parenting is to be looking for opportunities to connect, looking for opportunities that you didn't plan for yourself. And so the, looking for an open door, looking for an opportunity, just like this past week when we got together, we prayed and we went out, we were looking for an opportunity to connect with somebody. As parents, it's important to live our lives looking for the opportunity. Now here's what I want you to know about opportunities. Most of them are inconvenient. Right? Because they, they didn't, they don't fit, right? Right, Tamitha? 
<laughs> Most of them come when, when, when you, had, you had something going on and you, you had this plan and, and if you just could, and then all of a sudden this opportunity comes and that's your opportunity to stop what you're doing and to take the moment and do what God wants to do in that time. I believe that the same principles that we live as we reach out to God's people are the same principles we ought to live as we reach out to our children at home. There's going to be an opportunity. Um, I won't say who, but one of our kids, every time they, they, they started to take a bath, they started asking about heaven and hell. I, I, I'm not sure what the connection was there. If there was a drain that went down or something, I don't know. But, but, but they became an opportunity. How, how many of you know? Because when bath time comes, let's get this thing over with. Somebody say amen. amen. Let's just get this over with. I don't have time to sit here now and have a theological discussion. I, I, did, I, did that make sense? It's inconvenient when the moments come, but if we're not careful as parents, we'll miss the opportunity that God just, poof, puts right in front of us, right there. And we need to catch those opportunities as parents. So don't miss the opportunities. Now I want to transition, and that was just my little, I got, the, I got to get a little parenting thing off my chest at least once a year and just, just talk about these days and how things are these days. And, and now I want to move on to the fact that Loving our children boldly is not all that different from loving God's children boldly. So in the same way that you and I are called, now here's, here's where I want to I wanna just say that even if you don't have children in your home that you're parenting, this principle applies to every one of us because God calls all of us to love his children boldly. So I want to take a few things that we, that we sort of talked about already, and I want to talk about what does it look like, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a little bit, a few stories from this past week about how we step out of ourselves and we begin to love others boldly with the boldness that God has given to us. Because you remember we started in 1 Corinthians 13, it says if we don't have love. So love is the key to loving boldly. We have to love boldly. All right, so when you are a person who wants to love boldly, what is the first principle that you need to live with? I don't know if this is the first, but it's the first one that was on my list. The first principle that I think God wants us to understand is that you need to learn to trust the anointing of God, to trust God's anointing, to trust his anointing in your life. One of the things that, that we don't pay attention to enough is that even as a natural parent or a parent at home or as a person who is reaching out to God's children, God has given us his Holy Spirit and anointed us with abilities and with understanding and with words that we didn't plan for ourselves. So, so in both instances, we need to be willing and able to trust the anointing of God that is on us. And I want to say to you today that if you are a believer, the Holy Spirit is in you and you have the anointing of the Holy Spirit on you. You have the Holy Spirit presence of God in you. So trust the anointing to do what you couldn't do. This past week, um, one of the... Every evening we would come back and we would just talk with each other and, and share about what happened and what we experienced and what we learned and those kinds of things. And I remember Doug coming back and talking about they had been and they, had, they prayed for different people at the mall. And I probably won't get this exactly right, but I know that there was a person sitting there, a person th th that was nearby. And what I heard Doug say was, nothing in me wanted to go and do anything. Nothing in me wanted to go and connect with him. I was done. I didn't want to go. I didn't. But because the Holy Spirit was nudging him, he went even though he didn't have anything he felt. Are you with me? He went even though there wasn't anything in him that said, man, I'm fired up. This is going to be great. I can't imagine doing that anyhow. Do you ever get fired up, Doug? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But so out of obedience and trusting the anointing, the Spirit of God in him, he went to this person. And the long story short is when, he, when they ended up the conversation, I think Jim was with you maybe. And when they ended up the conversation, there was, there was a connection with this couple who had been hurt by the church who needed somebody to come alongside and just bless them and pray for them and love on them. Because the anointing, everybody say the anointing. You see, it wasn't because Doug had this great energy and Jim had this great insight. It was because they trusted, maybe God has something to do here. Are you with me? That's called trusting the anointing, that God is going to do something beyond what you can imagine. And so in that case, God was honored and the person was blessed. As a matter of fact, their whole family, I think, was blessed as a part of that prayer time. And they experienced the goodness of God. Um, last evening, Robert and Nancy were over at the Arboretum and... Um, 
they found a gentleman sitting on a park bench. And so they, they thought, well, well, let's go over and connect and see, see what's available here. And does God want to do something? And, and when they sat down, they began to talk and they connected and they made a relational connection. And then they asked whether they could pray for him. And he said to them, well, this is a divine appointment. He said, because just moments ago, and he pulled out his phone or whatever he had, and he showed them an email he had just sent of all the prayer needs that he had, of the things he needed prayer for. He had just sent this, and they sat down at that moment, and God opened the door for them to pray with him. Did I get that about right, Nancy? Pretty close. Because of the anointing. You see, loving God's children boldly means we need to trust that God is doing something that I can't see. And God knows what is the need over there. And God is going to do something that I can't imagine. But I just need to take the boldness to step out and say, I know that God has something for this person. One more story. Uh, I love this one because uh, Christy, where is Christy? She's in the back. Uh, they were out. Uh, two nights ago, I think, and they were up by Martin's. We just, we just went all over. As a matter of fact, by the end of the week, last night, somebody went to a, a lady who worked in one of the kiosks in the mall and asked if, if, asked if we could pray for her. And she said, somebody just prayed for me yesterday. What's going on? <laughs> so maybe we've saturated. I don't know. But, but, um, but Christy, what, they were up by Martin's and two employees from the ABC store walked out it. And as Christy tells it, I think, she's like, oh, no, they're not getting away. i got to pray for them. And she goes over to these two employees of the ABC store and asks, is there anything I can pray for? And the guy looks at her and he says, yes, absolutely. And he needed surgery. He's getting, having surgery on his neck. He's got an issue with his neck. And he asks her, the, you know what the ABC store is, right? The liquor store in town. And here's an employee that, you know, if we think in our own natural self, we go, oh, you know, leave them alone. No. This guy asked for, wanted prayer, received prayer, was blessed by the prayer. And how many of you would believe that, that the anointing was so heavy that he would be healed and God would catch his attention and just change his life? Right? But none of those things happen because we made them happen. They happen because we trusted the anointing of God to do something as we reached out. Are you with me? Last week I talked about Elijah stretched himself. Many people this week stretched themselves. All of us really. Except for maybe Debbie. Debbie's not here today. She's like the all-star. She was totally worn out. Debbie Shoemaker came every evening and she worked most of the evenings after the ministry time. She went to Charlottesville and worked and came back. She must have been worn out by this morning. But she seemed to like not, she was just like a natural. She just talked to anybody. And those of you that went with her, right? She just would talk to anybody. Anyhow, stretching ourselves and trusting God's anointing is the first thing I believe we need to do to love people. Acts 4.29, you should know it by now. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. How many of you would agree with me today that we can love boldly if we'll trust the anointing of God that is in us? Number one. Number two. Be available and watch. It's one thing to be available. It's another thing to watch for opportunities. Be available and watch. Some of you watched the little video of testimonies of some of the people the other day, and Judy Rank was on there throwing me under the bus. Did you all notice that? Yeah, she's like, I'm like Pastor Kevin who, who goes into a store and just has his focus and just doesn't look for people to minister to. And I'm like, okay. That's on the World Wide Web now. But I did say that last week in my message. But being available and watching. Change your attitude of what you're doing so that you are available and you're looking for opportunities. One of the greatest things that happened, if you talk to anybody, I'm going to have them stand here in a moment. Anybody that went out this week, and I'm going to challenge those of you that didn't go out. I know there were a lot of reasons why you didn't go out, but I know some of you didn't go out because you just didn't think it was you. And I'm going to challenge you that these people, most of us felt the same way. But we went and we were available and we watched. And what it did is it changed our perspective of daily communications and interactions. And so I got a, I got a message from Carol Swagger um, one of the evenings. And she said, well, I can't make it tonight, but I did pray for two people today and blessed them. And, and so she, because she's being available and she's watching now for opportunities. I will tell you this. 
Today, wherever you go, if you are in any kind of a public setting, if you're in any place where there are other people, there's going to be an available time. There's going to be an opportunity to pray for somebody and to minister the love of God. It's going to be anywhere you go, everywhere you go. There are people and they need God's love. It's about being available and watching for opportunities and looking for the things. Uh, Robert Rank was telling us last night that uh, in his own life, he works downtown uh, in the building that was the old police station, and so right across on the parking deck. And, and um, so he was saying that he has, because of, because of us coming together, he has begun to go out in the daytime on his breaks and walk the streets of Harrisonburg. And some of you introverts may, may really get this. He said, I, instead of going out, you know, he hasn't gone out and started praying for people and laying hands and shouting about Jesus, but he has started smiling at people and saying hello. Can an introvert in the room give me an Amen. He's just changing his own availability and working at it so that he begins to be able to find opportunities to watch for what's around him. I thought that was profound, and I appreciated Robert sharing that because for an, extreme, for an introvert, just the simple step of saying, I'm going to start smiling at people and saying hello, that's a huge step. But what it leads to is an availability that somebody may say something or there may be an open door where he begins to have the opportunity to pray for people. Now, I'm not saying he hasn't prayed for people. This week he did uh, during his time here with us. But that, I just wanted to share that with you, that, that anybody can take the next step of being available and watching for opportunities. Philippians 2, 3, and 4. I want you to listen to this and maybe write this down in your notes. Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Listen, every believer in the room needs to hear this. You and I are not here for us. We're not here for us. We're not here for us, and we're not here for us. We're here for others. And our role is to be available and watch for how I can touch somebody else with God's love. Somebody else. The, the greatest, quietest, shyest person in the room can become someone who touches others with God's love. And you're called to because the Bible says don't look only at your own interests, but be more interested in the, in the, in the needs of others and the, and the interests of others. So let's be available and watch. Number three, avoid the quick and easy. Avoid the quick and easy trap. Too many... Church people today want things to happen quickly and easily, just like we want in every other area of life. So we want all of a sudden to just be transformed and we all of a sudden are this, this person that does everything right. Or, or we want to, to go out and we want to see people just get saved and transformed all in one night and, and that's it. But here's the thing. When you begin to reach out and love boldly, you begin to understand that there are going to be people who come who don't have an, any clue what it means to be a Christian. And avoiding the quick and easy trap means that we say, I'm going to have to take time to be with this person and to listen to them and to pray with them and to disciple. Everybody say disciple. disciple. Discipleship isn't a thing that, that we really focus on very much, but discipleship is me taking another person. Everybody ought to have somebody that you're leading in the faith. If we think that we're going to change the world by coming together one evening and going, and out, going out and praying for people, that isn't going to happen. We're going to change the world when we begin to disciple people. We begin to bring them alongside. We let them into our lives and we enter into their life and we say, you know, call me when you have an issue and we'll pray with you and we'll go to their house and they'll come to our house and they'll be a part of our lives. And so here's what I want to, I want to say. The next level, the next level of loving boldly is engaging people in a discipleship relationship where we are available for them and we are ready to walk with them in the difficult things in their life. So Philippians 2.12 says, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my, own, my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good and pleasure. This past week, I, I would say 30 or so people came together and, 
And I'm going to have, if you, if you were here one evening at least this week, would you stand? I want you to stand up where you are. It's not to draw attention to you. I want people to see who went out. And the reason I want people to see is I want those of you who weren't here with us to look around and ask one of these people, what was it like? I want you to ask them because you're going to hear stories about how their lives were changed and challenged and shifted because they took a step and stretched themselves to go and do something that they were probably uncomfortable with. You all can be seated and thank you for, for being available. It didn't, I would say this, <laughs> uh, probably by Tuesday night I was tired. I'm old. You know, I did Sunday night and Monday night. I'm old, Dan. And, and by Tuesday night, I would go home. I'd drive home and I'd be like, do I, am I really going to go in there again? It, so my point is, it took effort for people to come each evening. Not only that, it took effort to do something that was outside of our normal schedule, but we chose to come and do that. Why? Because we wanted to change our lives. We wanted to become bold for God. We wanted to move into the things and two songs I want to leave you with this morning that I think were, would express what we experienced and what our heart is for you to experience as well, for every person to experience. The first song Caleb mentioned the other night when we were together, and uh, he, it was a song that, that we knew from years ago that he sort of declared over his life. It's called, I Want to Be Used by You. And it says, you are calling me, I can hear it clearly, to stand for purity and what's pleasing to your heart. You're showing me, I can see it clearly, a sense of destiny, to, a change from everything around. Take me by the hand and show me what you're planning. I want to be part of your design. Guide me by the heart and show me what's the future. I want to leave a mark on history. I want to be used by you. So don't look me over, I'm waiting for you. Broken, I want to be used by you. So have your way. Have your way. I would ask you to make that your prayer. God, I want to be used by you. I want to, I want to make a mark in history. I want, to, I want to be making a difference for you. I want to love boldly. I want to go for you into the places you've called me. And then the second song, uh, Liz actually sang a few weeks ago called Called Me Higher. It says, I could just sit and wait for all your goodness and hope to feel your presence. I could just stay. I could just stay right here where I am and hope to feel you. Hope to feel something again. And I could hold on. I could hold on to who I am and never let you change me from the inside. And I could be safe. Oh, I could be safe here in your arms and never leave home. Never let these walls down. But you have called me higher. You have called me deeper. And I'll go where you'll lead me, Lord. I'm willing to work for you. And for your glory. That's my prayer is that we avoid the quick and easy and move into what the things that, that God are calling us to that are different, that are hard, but that are a change. So the number four on your list is to make love your lifestyle. Make love your lifestyle. I want to go back again and, and close this morning by uh, reading 1 Corinthians 13 and then I just want to pray with us. Make love your lifestyle. I want to read the characteristics of love to you again because I believe that whether you're parenting children in your home or whether you're just reaching out to God's children around you, these principles, these realities need to become who we are. So 1 Corinthians 13, chapter 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag. Love is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. This week, I want to give you a couple of things to take home with you before we pray. First of all, I want to encourage you to look for one opportunity every day. Even if you didn't go out and you didn't participate with the Mission 429 teams this week, would you be a people who are looking for an opportunity? It can be a co-worker. It can be someone in your own house. Start there. On the way in this morning, I, I, I was suffering from the effects of having moved a bench that I shouldn't have moved last night. I told you I'm old. And, and uh, my back was really hurting. And I said to Caleb, at least you can pray for me. And he prayed and declared the, the healing of God. But even in your home, you might find an opportunity to pray. Look for an opportunity a day to pray with somebody. Number two, 
talk about who you saw today with your family. This will bring this to, 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 uh, to the forefront. When you're together in the evening, you're sitting together, you're spending time together, begin to talk about who you saw. You don't even have to have done any ministry, but, but, but because you're thinking about who you saw and you're going to share it with your family, it'll lift your eyes up. Begin to talk about, today I was at this place and I noticed this person or I noticed that person, but talk about who do you see around you and then as you're talking, you might come up with, maybe we could have prayed for them, or maybe I could have introduced uh, uh, myself to them and talked to them. What did you see the person was feeling? What did they look like? Number two. Number three, ask God for boldness and for Him to be made known in your life. Let's not stop asking God for boldness. I believe that God wants to change the lifestyles of all of us. I believe God wants to change every one of our lifestyles from a self-centered, consuming, give me what is good for me lifestyle to a lifestyle of reaching out and saying there are people out there, other people all around me who need the love of God and I'm going to be a person who's part of taking that to them. And so the last thing I want to share with you and I want you to respond to this. One of the evenings, uh, Debbie and Kara and Melissa went to Harris Gardens and just to find somebody to pray with. I don't know if you know where Harris Gardens is, but it's up on the north end of town there. Uh, and I think they had, that wasn't the night you had vegetables with you, was it? They had vegetables with them. Uh, Carol brought vegetables from her garden and we were giving out vegetables. You know, if you take things to give to people, you find out that people expect to pay for them. Like, well, how much are you asking? No, no, we're just giving them away. What? Who's giving stuff away? But they gave them away and they had the opportunity to pray with several people there at Harris Gardens. And when they left the place, the Lord laid it on Melissa's heart that there's an open door. There's, a, there's an openness there for ministry. And so some of us are dreaming about a Labor Day cookout that we would provide for Harris Gardens where we would just take the food, we'd take some tents, we'd take some supplies and we would just advertise a week or, ahead, a week or so ahead of time to all the apartments there and just go and bless them with ourselves and with the anointing of God that is in us. So here's what I want you to do. Because it's just, I'm th I threw this thing about Mission 429 out about a month ago and we had 20 people show up almost every evening. So this is the next thing. If you would be interested in being a part of that, by helping to plan, by helping to go, by being there, I, we would like to know today. So there are connect cards in front of you. I'd like you to take a connect card, say, I'm interested in the cookout or something, and let us know today so we can start to see whether there's enough people to say, Let's go do this. Let's just go bless the city. Let's bless a community in the city. So go ahead and take one of those and fill it out and leave it in the mailbox on your way out. And we would love to have um, the next opportunity God has for us. Amen. Let's stand for prayer.